for those uh, that are uh, not uh, community members, uh, I'm, Gr I'm my friend Garcia Grinda, uh, Diploma Unit Master here in the uh, DAA. And it is uh, with great pleasure that we are able to welcome Eloy Fernandez Porta here tonight to the AA. Eloy is a very, uh, young, still young, well, very, very unpromising. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Writer and cultural critic uh, based on, in Barcelona, when, uh, where he is currently teaching at the yeah. Universitat Pompeu Fabra, basically, uh, which is a kind of uh, university based on, uh, basically, a, an humanistic university. He is teaching new literary um, trends and art history there in, in the Pompeu Fabra. And am among other places, uh, he was teaching, uh, was in, in, in Duke University, and he was studying as well in Boston College. We just uh, recently spoke about it. And Eloy is, uh, is part of, um, uh, with uh, the writer, Agustin Fernandez Mayo, uh, he's part of uh, the so-called duo of uh, spoken word after Pop, Fernandez and Fernandez, you, you, mm -hmm. you share the, the surname, yeah. in which they make use of music, uh, images, and video to introduce uh, literary texts. Elo Eloy has published a lot of, uh, not, not a lot, actually five books, if I'm not yeah. wrong. Um, uh, as a writer, he, he published uh, Los Minutos de la Basura, that is entirely translated into English is the, the Trash Minutes in 1996 and uh, besides Caras B in 2001. And he's one of the representatives of the so-called Nocilla generation. Nocilla is kind of uh, the Spanish uh, version of Nutella, which is a hazelnut and chocolate uh, place, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah, that's, uh, that our mothers used to give us as a kind of um, a merienda, that is a, a evening snack. Uh, this generation is, uh, is basically, uh, they are establishing a new kind of um, uh, relationship with the uh, creative act in, in writing. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, they are like very young people, uh, born around uh, in 1970, or more or less. And they are not very well known outside of Spain, but I think they are like really powerful. Um, Eloy's books uh, are, uh, as, as a cultural critic, are art of after pop, uh, uh, literature of the media implosion, uh, edited, uh, edited in 2007, and Homo Sampler, uh, that deals with time and consuming the after pop era. Uh, that was edited in 2008. And what is interesting for us is this, uh, these books are showing a world with the aesthetic response to the status created by the symbolic excess uh, provoked by the mass media. Um, the, uh, this after pop notion is quite, is quite relevant and it's uh, something that we really did when just, we just discovered this summer when we were like, uh, let's say virtually together in a kind of uh, conferences, in a kind of lectures in the north part of, uh, north part of Spain in Santander. But this notion of after pop tries to redefine the artistic and literary ideas about pop culture, using the, the, the concepts taken from the, culture, the popular culture itself. And obviously, uh, the traditional pop culture still exists, but uh, as we probably know, has been difficult, diffused because of its own success. And nowadays, it's permeating and occupying every single aspect of our culture, from high culture and uh, till an artist scene or the political discourses. This implies a cultural shift and displacement of the notion of the pop object. Traditionally and theoretically considered as banal, weak, and let's say superficial. But nowadays the pop object is more and more becoming an, an, a highly sophisticated object that reclaims a second level of reading and sharper analytical tools. And is this sadly a kind of analytical tools to understand what is the role of popular culture in our society, what Eloy uh, bring uh, to us. You know. uh, Eloy has been the recipient of uh, very important awards, including the Premio, Premio um, Anagrama 2010. But what is more important uh, for us is that, that his writings reveal a not an kind of outgoing, fun, and anti-conventional and very sharp personal style to redefine the foundations of a kind of a new aesthetic. 
uh, a way of understanding as well affection, uh, objects, and cultural materials that permeates our time. Please uh, join me to in welcoming uh, Eloy Fernandez Porta to the Architectural Association. Well, thank you, Efren, for saying I'm still young. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of people to thank here, uh, certainly uh, Efren, Christina, um, Belinda, uh, Philip, uh, Nick, and uh, everyone else in this room for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, I suppose sh I should start by uh, explaining why do I, what do I mean with this um, provocative uh, title, my subculture it produces more emotional capital than yours. Let us consider the um, subcultural phenomenon, the very notion of um, subculture, under the sign of uh, struggle, under the sign of a certain conflict. Let's think about it, I would suggest, under the form of an uh, interpolation, something that I can uh, say to you, something that you can um, say, uh, say to me in a provocative and uh, even uh, offensive manner. Um, my subculture is more politically active than yours, would be the traditional statement or the traditional um, position that would serve to, uh, to define different kinds of uh, alternative uh, cultures. So, considering subcultures from a political point uh, of view, thus defining a peculiar uh, alternative uh, of uh, space, this would be um, Sir Van der Rocha's and other uh, theorists' uh, ideas. Subcultures might uh, serve primarily as the locus, as the site for a certain um, leftist um, political agenda, which would somehow uh, differ from uh, traditional, say, Marxist uh, political practices. This would be one possible definition of uh, subcult subculture. Let's go for a um, second one. Um, what about uh, my subculture is more avant-garde than yours. It's more uh, arty than yours. As we all know, this might be uh, Grail uh, Marcus's point. According to uh, Grail Marcus, what makes uh, subcultures uh, interesting and uh, aesthetically uh, powerful is their subtle relation with certain uh, trends, with certain uh, currents of uh, hybro art in such a way that, uh, according to uh, Professor uh, Marcus, such movements as uh, punk rock would be uh, interesting not only because they are uh, politically uh, engaging, uh, but mostly because they uh, represent uh, a new more elaborated version of, uh, say, uh, Dadaism or, or, or other uh, avant-garde uh, movements. Now, from my point of view, um, my subculture is more masculine than yours, or more macho than yours, would be the ultimate um, subtext that uh, has traditionally uh, defined um, subcultures. I see these phenomenon as uh, primarily an issue of uh, masculinity, as a certain, um, a certain form, as a certain uh, production of uh, masculinity that is different from, say, uh, mainstream uh, manhood, uh, but which does not always um, represent an, uh, a political alternative. And to that respect, I, uh, I am going to, uh, to be sort of um, critical. I'm going to be uh, critical concerning certain um, idealistic or romantic pre-assumptions that uh, are commonly used when, uh, when talking about, um, about um, subcultures. So, summing up. If um, 
masculinity has always been a central uh, issue. And um, political uh, issues were uh, the, the, key, uh, the key point, the most important uh, point, I would say, uh, in the 70s and, uh, and uh, 80s. While uh, art and the artistic dimension of subcultures became the most important, um, the most important notion or the, or the key term, at least since the early uh, 90s. If all that is true, then I would say that the contemporary notion of, uh, of um, subcultures, the, the way we, uh, we address this uh, phenomenon, is primarily um, emotional meaning that uh, these uh, movements, currents, or, uh, or uh, trends can be uh, distinguished by, um, or they are different to the extent that uh, each movement creates a certain recognizable emotional code that um, works um, in, at least in two different ways. It works uh, in a creative way by uh, presenting uh, a set uh, repertoire of uh, emotional behavior. And secondly, it works um, aggressively or uh, agonistically by uh, confronting another, uh, another uh, subculture, uh, again, under the form of uh, fight or, uh, or struggle. How does that uh, work? Can I, give, uh, can I give examples? Is that true? Well, I'm the kind of uh, guy who makes uh, sections, subsections, and uh, subdivisions. So this speech will, uh, will uh, be divided. I will divide this, this speech in, in three different sections. The first will be a little more conceptual. Um, the second one will be a little more uh, instrumental. I will try to offer certain, uh, certain tools, certain key terms, that I find very, uh, very useful in order to address, to address uh, today's um, subject. Um, the third part will be about uh, some specific uh, examples. And the fourth and more uh, important uh, part is uh, up to you guys. Uh, and that's going to be about uh, debate, uh, discussion, criticism, or uh, rotten tomatoes, if necessary, or complaints about uh, Cesc Fabregas going back to uh, Barcelona. Uh, if that's the point. So let's go very quickly through uh, certain conceptual issues I want to I wanna discuss. Um, I'm calling this first part on artistic style and emotional style. How, this, how do these two elements uh, relate? <clears throat> I would say that in recent years, a factor that, has, um, that had previously been missing from or perhaps just implicit to the debate about capitalism and its uh, discontents has been the emotional element. In different spheres of uh, study, we could say that the emphasis has gradually uh, shifted from what we could call an objectivist external description that is what capital does in statistics, uh, macro structures, and account movements, towards an analysis of the private and internal. That is how all these operations produce subjectivity. Now, from this viewpoint, the subjective can no longer be formulated in the romantic style as an unalienable uh, remnant of individuality opposed to the pressures of uh, social and political homogenization. Quite contrary, um, the subjective is an entity whose construction is a, a side effect of such um, pressures. Capitalism can and usually does repress and rebuke. However, what it does, above all, is create devices for individuality, shaping them and refining them better to respond to market demands and uh, consumer uh, requests. Now, this premise can be found in examples of discourse that appear to be very distant from each other. For instance, the philosophy of desire approaches it in a critical, political way, 
On the other hand, the sociology of uh, emotions does so um, descriptively and uh, we might say uh, resignedly. Uh, I mean, with, uh, with a certain, um, certain resignation. In all these spheres, the, what we could call the constructionist view of uh, subjectivity has become a practi uh, practically untouchable premise. In turn, its uh, omni omnipresence explains the rise and increasing popularity of so-called neo-pagan perspectives that, from uh, Michel Onfray to uh, Camille Paglia, seek to rehabilitate the figure of the non-predetermined um, subject, the master of its uh, impulses and affections. The dispute, the debate between these uh, two perspectives is, we could say, the battlefield on which the substance of the self, if such exists, is uh, fought on uh, is discussed in our days. But this is not only a conceptual uh, debate. Rather, it is a distinction to which we constantly turn to structure the social experience, dividing it into free figures and conditioned figures. For example, I am master of my own impulses, while the others are remote controlled or ordinar ordinary citizens are uh, programmed, uh, while artists are not. If we consider capitalism as a machine that produces subjectivity, then one of its main uh, mechanisms would be what has been called emotional style. According to uh, Professor Eva Ilus's definition, I quote, an emotional style takes place when a new interpersonal imagination is formulated. That is, a new way of thinking about the affective is interwoven with the aesthetic. Sorry, uh, a new way of thinking about the relationship of the self to others and imagining its uh, potentialities. Let's try to explain a little more. According to this concept, the affective is uh, related with uh, the aesthetic or only exists as a side effect of the aesthetic. The way of expressing one's own subjectivity is produced and not merely uh, calculated in relation to a set of uh, possibilities that unfold in the sphere uh, of the relations, uh, of personal relations, conceived as a market. This implies that the different models of feeling that interplay and relate in the public arena will no longer be uh, evaluated according to their uh, veracity, but rather according to criteria of cultural acceptability, which is to say the criteria we use to gauge the relevance of artistic contributions. Little does it matter whether an expansion of emotion is sincere. What matters, what matters is whether the aesthetic form it adopts enables it to operate on the market. <clears throat> For instance, a depressed mood, the style of, uh, of um, depression, what used to be called uh, melancholy, can be formulated as a, an adolescent and immature emotional style, as of course with the emo movement, or as, a, as an adult central European emotional style, as, representing by, as represented by uh, Austrian uh, novelist uh, Thomas Bernhardt, uh, the uh, epitome of uh, central uh, European uh, post-Nazi uh, uh, depressive uh, mood, nihilistic uh, mood. Or, uh, this would be the third possibility, it could be uh, formulated in an ironic uh, or cool emotional style I'm going to uh, quote a Spanish uh, pop band called uh, Astrut, 
uh, which has a song that says uh, miedo, mm, miedo a la muerte estilo imperio, uh, which means uh, fear, of, uh, fear of death imperial style. Uh, the, uh, the motto of the, uh, of the song saying, uh, Biedermeyer uh, depressions, uh, Louis XV bad bites. So this is another different uh, elaboration of, uh, uh, of depression. Depression considered as a, as a say, a crude, basic uh, material that can be, uh, you see, ar uh, artistically uh, elaborated. Now, in each case, in each of these three uh, cases, the impulsive and cognitive complex we call depression ceases to be something private and takes on objective uh, consistency and meaning in a given uh, context of reception. <clears throat> From the cultural economics point uh, of view, such contexts have uh, different values corresponding to different strata and uh, criteria for uh, evaluation. This might lead us to uh, imagine a depressive family personifying three successive stages uh, in the cultural arena. So that we might have the 60 or 70 year old uh, father who is uh, depressed in uh, Bernhardian uh, style that represents, we, we could say, uh, modern uh, humanism. Then we have the son uh, who listens to uh, Astrud. We can substitute Astrud by, uh, say, um, Tinder sticks or maybe, uh, maybe the magnetic fields, uh, who uh, symbolizes the certain uh, indie uh, scene. And then we have the um, emo uh, grandson or granddaughter who uh, emit, uh, epitomizes uh, mainstream uh, teens. Now, in this context, uh, feeling does not mean experiencing uh, an emotion, but externalizing it in a recognizable way. Culture wars, this is one of my central points, are also, and perhaps primarily, a battle to uh, ascertain and define the right way of feeling and of expressing this. The winner of this war is whoever can persuade the majority that their own emotional style is the bottom line in feeling, authenticity, or whatever resembles them uh, best, to the effect that all other expressions appear to be mere styles, which is to say affectations, uh, pantomimes, or uh, stylized uh, deviations from the uh, hegemonic uh, mood. As we might notice, in this process, the idea of style has been transferred from the art sphere to that of sociology, where it is converted into the recognizable and acceptable form of an emotional complex. Even more, one might say that this idea has gained in importance in one field as it has lost it in the other. If we imagine a conversation about emotions between an art critic and a, and a sociologist, we may well foresee an essential uh, disagreement over this term. No doubt, the critic would say that the idea of style applied to the study of the arts is, uh, to say the least, problematic, as it depends on an overly romantic um, uh, conception of the self and uh, authorship, which is of little value in this uh, multidisciplinary age in which a single artist um, can go from drawing to video uh, installations and uh, from text uh, to image uh, with uh, the most uh, varied uh, stylistic uh, results. Um, to make this point a little more uh, clear, to explain wh why do I mean by, uh, by style, my, my idea uh, of, uh, of, the, of, of an artist would uh, epitomize the contemporary notion uh, of style would be uh, somebody like uh, Julian, uh, like Julian Obi, that is um, somebody who has a very uh, recognizable um, style that you can identify uh, at first uh, sight, uh, which uh, which works, which uh, serves as a, well as a sort of uh, brand uh, registered uh, style, 
but that it is not uh, meant uh, to be um, or original uh, individual uh, or even um, or even uh, psychological. It is uh, presented as uh, the way I see it as the, the, the pantomime of a style or the second degree of, uh, uh, of a style. Ron, I'd like to know if you more or less agree with, uh, with this or, uh, or not. So uh, my point would be that while, uh, while the art critic, um, the, uh, the proverbial uh, art critic, would find this notion at least uh, problematic, the, uh, the sociologist would reply that the citizen as consumer, as consumer is becoming stylized in an ever more uh, self-conscious and sophisticated uh, way, that their changes in style are merely stages in a recognizable process in the construction of the self, and that, above all, uh, that these uh, changes in clothes, musical tastes, and uh, relational forms do not uh, occur in just any undifferentiated uh, environment in which uh, anything goes, as a postmodernist critic would, would say, but respond to um, very specific local modes of uh, reception. The paradox here being that the less value the notion of style has in the, uh, in the art space, the more importance it acquires on the emotional market. Now, I'm pretty sure that this, uh, this um, well, um, development will very much uh, remind you to the, uh, to the words of uh, Dick uh, Hebdige and his famous uh, elabor elaboration of uh, subculture as the meaning of, uh, of uh, style. Well, Hebdige's point is a little more, um, I would say, classically political than, uh, than, than mine, because I would, uh, I would add, even as a, as a, as a footnote, to his, uh, his brilliant um, subculture uh, theory, that the, um, that the notion of, uh, of uh, emotional uh, style becomes the very, uh, the very center of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the phenomenon. The emo, uh, movement, the emo uh, movement, movement as, uh, as vulgar or bizarre as it might, uh, as it might uh, be, representing the point uh, in, uh, in which um, a, certain, a certain way to uh, express uh, a classical uh, emotional code, the code of, uh, uh, of uh, melancholia and teenage uh, depression, becomes the very, uh, the, the, um, becomes the, the key point of the, of the movement, which makes this uh, subculture completely different from, uh, say, uh, from its uh, um, older brother, which would be, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> so-called uh, sinister uh, rock, you know, uh, the Cure, Jesus and Mary Chain, uh, etc. I suppose some of you might, uh, might say, uh, well, uh, these bands you, you just named are obviously better, artistically better than, uh, than, uh, emo, than emo bands. Uh, yeah, quite right, but uh, my, uh, the central point for uh, for me is that um, a sinister rock fan would have never uh, would have never uh, said that um, expression of uh, of individuality or um, or expression of a certain uh, emotional uh, code uh, is the reason he joined this uh, this um, subculture. I would say that uh, the uh, the emo younger brother or uh, or sister. Has become much more self, uh, much, much more uh, self-conscious of uh, of this uh, of this element. Let me try try to uh, clarify this point by giving uh, three or four uh, three or four terms that uh, that I find especially um, especially uh, useful um, in the context of um, in the context of uh, sociology of uh, of emotions. Mm. The pre-assumption that lies behind um, sociology of emotions is that feelings are, um, by definition, public, expressive, and social. Uh, they are also indexal, which means that they, ser they serve to indicate your position in a certain scale of values. So that the so-called biological and psychological roots 
of feeling would be only the basis for a social and political construction. Feelings are not only the surplus uh, of an idea, they are the signal that makes this idea socially, um, socially um, acceptable. I would uh, exemplify this, this feeling with the, uh, uh, with the sentence, um, I would exemplify this notion uh, with the sentence, objectively speaking, I find my wife quite good. Um, what I mean by this is that even in a situation that requires an, uh, an emotional, uh, an emotional uh, implica implication, getting a girlfriend or, or being uh, married, you, you can get married like objectively, uh, even in such, uh, in such a situation, you are supposed to sort of uh, snap out of it and, uh, and um, see it from an outside, allegedly uh, objective position. This might lead us to, um, to a definition of artistic uh, sensibility that has been, uh, that, that is uh, quite close to, uh, to uh, Pierre uh, Bourdieu's. Artistic sensibility is seen as a set of uh, communicative conventions that make possible to affirm or redesign our social status by referring to cultural production. Um, the sentence that would better uh, well, uh, sum up this uh, definition being, uh, I know I belong to a certain class or to a certain group because I say that I enjoy or I didn't enjoy this uh, work of art. Later on maybe we could uh, discuss what do we, uh, what do we think when we, uh, when we hear the words class or group, uh, is, is the term uh, class still uh, useful, still uh, active, how has it been uh, uh, redefined? Let's, let's, leave it, let's leave it as the, uh, as the definition. Mm. If, um, if that is true, then we could also talk about, um, about uh, the, the sphere of, uh, of emotions as, uh, as a sphere of, uh, of power, as a sphere that, uh, that produces uh, hierarchy. Um, according to um, Italian uh, cultural critic uh, Mario uh, Perniola, sensology is a form of power that presupposes a general accepted consensus rooted in sensitive and uh, affective uh, factors. Um, Perniola presented this, uh, this term in a uh, in a book called, um, called uh, Against uh, Communication. Uh, and uh, later on, he gave a second, second version or a, or a different uh, elaboration of it uh, uh, in a book called uh, On Feeling. Uh, I know there's an, uh, that there should be an English translation of, of that for the Spanish uh, translation. What, um, what Perniola was trying to uh, get at with, uh, with this is a new and very original uh, version of, uh, of uh, Marxism uh, by which uh, power and oppression will no longer be, uh, be defined in terms of an imposition of, uh, of ideas, notions of, uh, or concepts, that is ide ideology as is traditionally uh, conceived, but uh, rather, um, power would be, uh, first of all, uh, exercised by the, um, the transmission of certain emotional, uh, emotional codes. So that the, the most important uh, point would be uh, not, what you, not what, you, what you think or what you uh, believe, uh, but rather what you are supposed to feel. At a certain, um, at a, on a given, uh, on a given moment, we could say that uh, Perniola's notion of uh, of uh, sensology is a politicization or a generalization of a more specific uh, term, the um, the term uh, emotional uh, emotional rule. An emotional rule is a principle or a set of principles. Mm that establish the correct way to feel in, um, in a given situation. Um, the, uh, the sentence that could, uh, you know, 
summarize this, uh, this idea would be, um, you know how you should feel, or uh, you should feel uh, happy that you even have a job. There are certain social situations in which we become uh, aware that there, there are certain uh, non-written uh, non uh, laws, um, and that we are supposed to behave even when we don't know exactly how these laws uh, work. Uh, we've all been to funerals, uh, and uh, we've all uh, felt this uh, annoying, uh, this annoying uh, feeling by which we don't uh, exactly know how are we supposed to, um, you know, to, to express our uh, our grief? Uh, it's like, uh, okay, I'm, I'm I'm sad about this uh, about this uh, guy's uh, death, uh, but then I'm not his brother, so I'm not uh, supposed to, to, to cry and uh, and and weep. But I'm so I, I we we used to be uh, we used to be sort of uh, close, uh, kinda. So uh, I should uh, look um, sad. But not, uh, but not uh, too much. A little detached, a little, uh, a little more than this woman who is desperate, but a little less than you know th that sort of that sort of thing. Um, subcultures are like uh, are like funerals to the extent that there are certain uh, non-written uh, rules that we all have to uh, have to respect. And I'm going to to use certain certain examples that that show that um, that show that subcultures. Do not only work as a, as a space of uh, you know of uh, freedom, uh, liberation, self-expression, uh, punk, pogo, uh, beer, and uh, and anarchy. They uh, they mostly uh, work as a, as a very structured set of uh, set of uh, of rules, which is better uh, perceived when you are not an uh, an insider, as we all uh, as we all know. So if, uh, if Perniola is, uh, is uh, right, if there is such thing as, a, um, as an emotional uh, mainstream that can be, um, that can be uh, expressed and uh, transferred by uh, the media, by mainstream uh, culture, uh, and even by a certain um, you know, uh, banalization of uh, alternative uh, culture, then, according to his text, the possible uh, response or uh, alternative would be in what, uh, in what uh, uh, he uh, calls uh, alternative uh, sensologies, uh, which are different uh, and original forms of uh, feeling. Problem is, uh, Perniola is sort of uh, unspecific when he uh, uses the word uh, alternative uh, sensology. He uh, refers uh, very uh, vaguely and uh, uh, obliquely to, uh, to um, subcultures based on, uh, based on uh, music and uh, style and uh, clothes. And at some point, he seems to be, to be talking about uh, rap and, uh, and uh, hip hop. But he deals with the issue like more, uh, more conceptually than, uh, than uh, practically. So uh, what I would suggest is to. Uh, Third part of my uh, of my speech is to search for certain um, for certain examples for two different uh, examples that might uh, that might prove this uh, this point of view or this uh, thesis uh, right. Um, first of all, I'm going to uh, to refer to uh, to the punk movement, mm. and I'm going to quote the work of um, of a Spanish uh, writer called uh, Kiko uh, Amat. As far as I know, he's not been translated to, uh, to English. But um, his work is very sort of uh, easy to, uh, yeah, to, to, to explain here in, uh, here in England, because he has been uh, usually, uh, described, uh, usually described as a sort of uh, Catalan uh, Alan Silito, you know, the, the uh, left-wing uh, working class, uh, class pride uh, worker. Uh, with a um, nihilist, uh, no future for you uh, thing, but also very stylish, very uh, very baroque, uh, and with a with a style that I would uh, define as the um, as the um, uh, magazine uh, as the as the trend magazine baroque, uh, which is a very uh, very um, a very typical Spanish phenomenon. Uh, the the baroque style in uh, literature and um, and, and art and, uh, and painting 
is we could say the, the main or the major style in traditional, uh, in traditional culture, or at least it used, uh, it used uh, to be until uh, I would say the, uh, the, the 80s, uh, when uh, with the rise of uh, democracy and the, uh, the, the establishment of a new, uh, of a new um, yeah, publisher, uh, publisher uh, market, um, there was a certain, uh, a certain pressure for, for writers to, um, to write in a more um, you know, a cosmopolitan and international style, style that could be uh, easily uh, translated uh, even, uh, even better, a style that sounded like, uh, like, uh, like a translation from, uh, from uh, English. That was the point in which, uh, in which uh, Baroque style in Spanish uh, fiction became sort of uh, outfashioned, uh, suspicious, became somehow related to the, to the right uh, wing. A very interesting phenomenon was that uh, while uh, Baroque style disappeared from, uh, virtually disappeared from uh, mainstream um, um, novel or uh, fiction, it reappeared in uh, music magazines and, uh, and fashion uh, magazines and uh, trendy and uh, alternative uh, media. And uh, Kiko Amat's, uh style would be a, a good example of, uh, of this. So what is uh, Kiko Amat's fiction about and less, what does he have to say about uh, subcultures and, uh, and emotion? Well, Amat has a, a very interesting novel, his third, called uh, Rompe Pistas, which is uh, an autobiographical uh, account of uh, a group of uh, punk friends uh, coming of uh, age, growing up in the, uh, in the town of uh, Samboy, which is a peripheral, uh, a peripheral town uh, in the environs of, uh, of uh, Barcelona. There are several um, aspects of this, um, of this uh, novel that I, I found uh, very, very useful in order to, um, as, a, as a new point of view concerning subcultural uh, phenomena. First of all, punk um, is usually uh, defined uh, politically. Every uh, punk uh, guy or girl is supposed to be an, um, is supposed to have an, um, um, an enemy mm, called the bourgeois, the, the, the middle class, um, whatever, you, uh, whatever you call it. A very interesting point about uh, this novel, uh, Rompe Pistas, is that uh, the, the middle uh, class does not, uh, does not appear. There is no such thing as middle class or even middle class uh, conscience in that, um, in that uh, context. Uh, everybody, uh, uh, it's not even mentioned. So uh, all characters will, would uh, belong to the, uh, either to the working class or to, or to what uh, Marx called the, the lumpen, uh, the lumpen uh, proletariat. A second element is uh, the way uh, a punk uh, group is, um, is uh, created with um, some uh, dozen of, uh, of uh, guys uh, getting, uh, getting together, doing destroys at, uh, at uh, night, forming a, forming a band, uh, etc. And um, how this, uh, this phenomenon is uh, explained in terms of, uh, of masculinity. According to, uh, to Amat, th this is not literally what he says, it's my reading of his, uh, of his uh, text. He describes like uh, three different types of, uh, of uh, men in, uh, in some boy uh, that was uh, in, the, uh, in, the late, uh, in the late 80s and early, uh, and early uh, 90s. First of all, there are uh, delinquents who, uh, who have been, uh, have been in, uh, in, in jail uh, and uh, who, uh, well, basically terrorize the, uh, the, the place, uh, wandering in, uh, in stolen uh, cars and uh, eventually uh, beating off the, uh, the, the, the punks and, uh, and scaring the, uh, uh, the, the neighbors. And they would be like at the, at the top of the masculinity scale. Secondly, there are um, rugby players uh, who are uh, tough, uh, strong, uh, you know, outdoorsy, outgoing. Uh, they exercise a lot. They are muscular, uh, uh, and they have like the like the correct uh, body. And they would only be uh, second 
to the to the um, you know uh, thieves and uh, and burglars. And um, third and lastly, there are uh, there are punks, uh, which are um, which are sort of uh, bad, but they are not so bad. They are not so mean as to become um, real uh, delinquents. Um, and uh, they are tough, but they are not tough enough to become, uh, to become uh, sportsmen. They tried. Uh, eventually, they enrolled in the, uh, in the rugby team. Tukamat uh, usually refers to, this, uh, to, to rugby as uh, the sport, generically uh, called. They couldn't, fit, uh, they couldn't fit in because they weren't, uh, they weren't uh, good enough. So that being punk uh, would become like the third, uh, the third uh, option. And they are very short, or at least the, the protagonist, who's also the narrator, is very uh, uh, sort of uh, aware that uh, he and his friends represent a sort of, uh, sort of trashy uh, masculinity that can only uh, uh, prevail by uh, creating uh, a very, uh, you know, a very anal, uh, verbal, uh, expressive, uh, expressive, uh, and uh, scatological uh, code. There is a, a, a very brilliant uh, scene in which uh, Ahmad describes the body, the, the body politics of uh, of punk by explaining uh, what, how these two groups, the rugby players and the uh, and uh, uh, and the punks, uh, got together in a uh, in a swimming pool. And how the uh, and how the you know the the rugby uh, players are good uh, are excellent perfect uh, swimmers and uh, and they have like serious uh, girlfriends uh, etc. While the the punks the only thing they can uh, uh, they can do is uh, you know pretty much uh, fart and terrorize uh, and terrorize the uh, the the place. So there's this uh, there's there's this sense that um, there are certain uh, mm, that uh, there are certain uh, masculinity roles. And masculinity uh, models, and uh, punks are not defined, say, as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, whatever uh, rich kids or uh, or um, bourgeois uh, people. They are defined as opposed to um, you know to uh, to um, local uh, to local uh, sportsmen. Um, an important question uh, being, where does that uh, leave uh, women? Uh, well, women have virtually no place in this context, and this has been one of the traditional uh, one of the traditional critiques to the politics of uh, of uh, subculture. How an allegedly uh, leftist, alternative, and even revolutionary subculture does usually uh, reproduce. Gender codes and uh, and gender uh, rules that can be as uh, as uh, macho as uh, mainstream culture and uh, in in some cases they are even worse because they uh, they can um, sort of pass unnoticed uh, when uh, because they happen in an alternative uh, in an alternative uh, space in which uh, macho uh, attitude can uh, can easily uh, can easily pass as a as a sign. Of, uh, of whatever, uh, either uh, strength or even uh, political, uh, or even political concern. This is a classical, a classic problem with the Spanish, uh, with the Spanish left. Uh, I don't know if this, the, the, if we could say the same about the, the English uh, left. You'd, uh, you'd tell me. But uh, well, the the point about um, uh rompepistas um, is that um, the creation. Of a certain uh, alternative uh, alternative uh, community, uh, based on uh, on very strong and uh, exclusive uh, masculine uh, gender uh, gender uh, roles, um, is also um, is also done, and this is a surprising uh, element, uh, with um, with uh, with a practical, uh, we, uh, almost with no musical uh, references. We all know how. Most um, most novels dealing with uh, subcultures, no matter what the subculture uh, is, uh, tend to be uh, tend to be you know name dropping uh, uh, texts uh, with uh, lots of uh, quotations and uh, and uh, references. Um, Kikwamat has the uh, has the idea that there's uh, that um, concerning music, um, the uh, 
the, the upper classes, the, the middle classes, if they still uh, exist, have to have <coughs> uh, contemplative relation with uh, with music. <coughs> uh, they see it is uh, in a more uh, in a more uh, artistic uh, artistic way. They are more contemplative uh, towards it, while the um, the uh, the working classes would have a more um, a more uh, practical. Uh, relation with uh, with it, they would uh, they, they would use it and uh, and throw it uh, and throw it away. Uh, they would uh, be um, less, according to uh, to Amat, they would um, n not that the, the the working classes uh, have like less of an of an aesthetic sense. That that's not his uh, that's not his point. But the the creation of an uh, of an archive. Out of uh, out of pop uh, music, uh, like a, a complete uh, archive and a, and a certain well knowledge, competence, uh, etc., would be according to Am to, to Amat more important for the middle classes than for the working classes. And I I, I would say that uh, Bourdieu would to a certain extent uh, be um, uh, agree with that uh, with that point. So according to Amat, the way mm, the way a group of um, a group of uh, teenage um, uh, guys with no uh, with no uh, future uh, gather and create their own uh, their own community is uh, strictly uh, based on um, on a shared uh, feeling of um, rage uh, and uh, and uh, which is uh, the way he uh, the way he described it the way he described it very uh, very theatrical. And very uh, and very performative. A very interesting uh, thing about this uh, about this novel is the way it um, it presents uh, the uh, the situations of uh, masculine uh, friendship and masculine uh, complicity as um, in a very uh, theatrical and uh, and performative way. In some cases, you you feel that you're reading uh, Judith Butler and not uh, and not Kiko Kiko Amad because all the guys. Are very um, are very self uh, self aware of the way they have to uh, they have to behave um, with their uh, with their uh, well uh, mates and uh, and colleagues and to and to that respect uh, he also seems to be quite uh, quite um, you know suspicious about the so-called uh, authenticity of uh, of, uh, of feeling that is usually um, considered the, the source of uh, of you know of subcultural uh, of subcultural phenomena. Mm, may we uh, stick to uh, to punk, but switch the uh, but switch the the, the focus? Um, while um, in, the, uh, in the year uh, 1991, uh, while uh, Amad was uh, was leaving the story, he was he would uh, later on explain in his uh, in his uh, novel uh, a girl a girl called uh, Christina. Who appears in uh, Sarah Marcos's uh, book uh, *Girls to the Front*, uh, subtitled *The True Story of the Riot Girl uh, Revolution*? Christina would uh, run into a uh, into a fanzine um, that was uh, published by the uh, by the um, once uh, famous uh, Bikini Kill uh, band. Uh, I'm quoting uh, Sarah Marcos here. Back in her dorm that night, Christina read the zine and latched it on to one page that had the words dork and cool running all around the border. Having never seen coolness as an option for herself, Christina was comforted by this dork manifesto that started out, quote, being cool in our culture means being cold, standoffish, uncaring, you're too cool to notice a lot of things, and self-absorbed end of the quote, and continued. By claiming dork as cool, we can confuse and disrupt this whole process. The idea is that not only have we decided that being a dork, uh, parenthesis, not repressing our supposedly feminine qualities like nice, niceness and telling people how we feel is cool and thus valuable to us, but also that we are not willing to accept claims that how we are is wrong, underdeveloped, bad, or uncool. Well, no matter how uh, fanzine-ish or uh, naive this, uh, this quotation is, I believe it, uh, it touches an important, uh, an important uh, gender uh, issue 
concerning uh, first the development of the punk uh, movement with its different uh, with its different uh, derivations, including uh, the the riot uh, the riot girls of the uh, uh, of the 90s, and the uh, and uh, and the use of emotional uh, uh, of emotional codes. Um, the notion of uh, the notion of cool that has, as we all uh, know, many different uh, many different uh, definitions. If we stick to this uh, to this particular uh, definition, cool considered as um, uh, cold, uh, distant, uh, unexpressive, uh, uncaring, and even un, uh, unemotional. This has been the the core of uh, the well the the central attitude that served to uh, to to define the people who are in um, the, the the in crowd at a certain uh, certain uh, subculture, even in the context of such um, allegedly expressive uh, subcultures as uh, as uh, punk. The uh, the discussion between uh, between coolness and darkness, if we might uh, if we might uh, uh, call it that. If we might uh, put it this uh, this way, is as I uh, as I uh, see it an an attempt uh, on the part of uh, of a group of women uh, from the early nineties uh, to um, take cool out of uh, out of uh, punk and uh, redefine this uh, this uh, movement from a different uh, gender and emotional uh, and emotional perspective. And I would say that 10 years uh, later, contemporary versions of, uh, of punk are very much uh, indebted to this, uh, to this change, to this, uh, to this um, well, sort of uh, riot girl revolution, as uh, Sarah Marcus, uh, Sarah Marcus uh, called it. So I would uh, finish this part of my, uh, of my uh, dissertation by, uh, by suggesting that um, every time we uh, we address a certain um, a certain uh, group, a certain class, or a certain uh, subcultural uh, phenomenon, um, we uh, could um, we could use these uh, well these these tools and try to be uh, to be uh, aware of um, summing up uh, first what's the traditional um, emotional code that's uh, that's going on here. Second, is it masculine by, uh, by uh, definition? Third, does it work the same, does it work equally? Does this emotional code, code work uh, equally when it's expressed by uh, men, women, gays, lesbians? Uh, does it make any, uh, does it make any, uh, any difference? A fourth uh, important point uh, would be how performative is this um, how self-conscious of its own uh, performative is this uh, subculture? My idea is that um, uh, being uh, being self-conscious does not make you uh, does not make you intelligent, does not make you uh, good, and it certainly does not make uh, a subculture uh, better than uh, than others. The case of uh, emo is, uh, is very uh, is very uh, clear, but at least it um, it uh, allows you to um, well to to open the field for different forms of uh, uh, expression and uh, and uh, subjectivity. The case of uh, the, the case of uh, emo is very interesting in certain how in certain uh, um, places in of uh, in uh, Latin America and specifically in uh, in Colombia, it gave rise to an anti uh, emo uh, movement. Which, uh, which was uh, basically a macho uh, reaction against the uh, dangerous uh, feminization that, uh, that was um, typical of the, uh, of the emo uh, guys who would uh, you know, uh, read, uh, read poems, uh, look, uh, look uh, ambiguous, and would not uh, conform to the, uh, to the, to the model of uh, macho uh, men. Uh, not the mainstream macho man, neither the alternative macho uh, macho man. So that that was another another um, well another battle in the history of uh, in the history of uh, punk. You got uh, you got uh, well fights, you got uh, sort of um, prosecution 
of the uh, of the uh, of, uh, all, all of a sudden the uh, the Colombian uh, emo uh, emo uh, movement uh, stopped being just uh, a commodified uh, product and uh, and became something uh, something political uh, because it was obvious that it was uh, it was uh, that this movement was was bringing certain issues uh, concerning concerning uh, well gender uh, masculinity uh, etc that couldn't be uh, uh, accepted uh, even by uh, you know the uh, the ones who are supposed to be uh, the left of the uh, uh, the left of the uh, of the left. One uh, fifth and last uh, point um, would be how a certain um, a certain movement creates uh, what we could call an um, an emotional um, an emotional transference. I, I've already touched this uh, this uh, this notion, but uh, more specifically, what I mean by uh, by emotional transference is how. Um, Do I convince every, um, someone that my uh, that my feelings are uh, are legitimate? Are there any um, any forms of uh, of institutionalization that say, okay, it is right to feel or to act that uh, that way? Uh, who, who's doing that? Uh, for instance, uh, are uh, Pitchfork music uh, music critics? Uh, deciding how uh, music consumers are supposed to, to feel towards certain uh, certain uh, music um, is it about um, is it about cool hunters is it about actors or, or public uh, figures representing uh, or, or behaving in a certain uh, in a certain way how do these processes of uh, legitimation uh, work so this is uh, what I, what I had to uh, to say. Uh, now it's your turn for questions, uh, criticism, and uh, rotten tomatoes if necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Hello, for for this brilliant presentation. Uh, do you do you have any 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 question for Eloy? Any comment? I I would suggest something that, uh, that was like uh, uh, quite interesting for me at least. That is this this notion of uh, emotion as a new way of uh, um, let's say of constructing uh, subcultures yeah. could be. You were mentioning it, uh, mentioning it in some point. Could be again political, you know, or could be again re, uh, re, um, reassem reassembling the political issues in, in, in a society through uh, consensus or through lack of consensus with the mainstream, uh, mm -hmm. you know, society. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I would like to to ask you about uh, this new kind of um, uh, political consciousness that is permeating everything you know in Europe especially that is quite present in the school as well nowadays and how this construction of emotions could be uh, relating back to this new political agenda of the young the youth movement you know that is quite present I don't know if this uh, is uh, reconstructed again through subcultures you know I don't know if this political agenda is for the young people the young generation mm. being reconstructed through this kind of engagement in a quite a specific group of people but it's been um, you know uh, reassembled through different means I don't know what, what's your opinion if uh, and there is a kind of another <coughs> important issue at least for, for, for uh, the people that that, that that is working again with subcultures if uh, whether uh, the subculture or that uh, do exist or there something belonging to the to the past I don't know what's what's your opinion with two, these two main things. Well, uh, first of all, I, uh, I certainly believe that they do um, they do exist, although probably they they, they no longer exist in the form that uh, good old uh, Dick uh, Hebditch uh, imagined them. They they certainly exist in a more um, flashy and uh, and intermittent way. 
um, in such a way that, uh, that this uh, girl here um, can uh, switch from uh, emo to uh, political uh, indignation um, from, uh, from time to time. And um, concerning um, this the new political uh, movements that uh, that are uh, you know rising uh, through through Europe, I would say that um, first of all, I would say that uh, indignation as um, as a legitimate uh, as the legitimate feeling of the of the moment is a, is a space in which the, um, the classical uh, left and the subcultural uh, left can, uh, can agree. They can eventually agree. I can see some places where that is, uh, where that is, uh, is, uh, is happening. The problem concerning political, uh, political uh, activism is, uh, from, from, from the point of view of sociology of, the sociology of emotions, the, the difference between the uh, the emotional uh, code of the uh, labor union uh, guy and uh, the, uh, the emotional code of the um, leftist fashion uh, designer, which have been traditionally too, uh, too, too different and even too, uh, too uh, opposite. In the case of the, of the, Spanish, um, indignation, uh, of the Spanish indignado uh, movement, I, uh, I recall a certain tension concerning the, uh, the, the concerning pacifism, concerning the, the pacifist uh, and non-violent uh, uh, claim, because the, uh, the um, LGTB movement and the, uh, and the, the um, punk feminist uh, movement um, is not pacifist, is not uh, non-violent, uh, non and does not, uh, does not uh, you know, uh, believe in this notion of, uh, con of uh, you know, consensus and, uh, and respect, not in Spain. And uh, I believe they're 100% right. There are, there are certain people you don't, you don't deal with. There are, cer there are certain people you don't have to, uh, to, uh, to respect. So summing up, it's, I believe it's, it's always a, uh, a matter of um, sort of a jigsaw in which you, you have to, to put all these all this emotional pieces uh, together and see how they, uh, how they fit. Uh, I don't know if this, if this, uh, if this phenomenon, this reluctancy of uh, of feminist uh, groups to get into the uh, to into the uh, indignation uh, movement is also taking place here in uh, here in England. Is it similar? Is it different? How does it work? Uh, it's gotta be different, I suppose. I think it's, it's quite different. What, what, is what I think is, is really interesting is that uh, this indignado movement is uh, is based on a common feeling, mm -hmm. you know, which is which is the sense of indignation that hasn't um, that hasn't nothing to do with um, uh, anything to do with uh, kind of objectivization of a kind of political approach. It's nothing that is in common, but it's kind of feeling of being uh, that everything is wrong, you know, mm -hmm. politically politically speaking. I think that that relates back to your notion of uh, emotions as uh, one of the main uh, uh, forces that nowadays uh, are driving, you know, the, mm -hmm. the the subcultural and the group uh, creation. You know. Yeah, and then well, some people might claim that the politics of uh, of shared feeling is dangerous because shared feeling and common feeling has been traditionally <coughs> not only heterosexual but heteronormative by default. The common feeling we all agree on. Some people might have issues with that. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any any questions for for Lloyd? Any comments? Mm -hmm. I have the question about um, how you judge of this emotion turn to um, be political, because um, from my understanding, it would be um, uh, exp express how ex express their feeling like engaged with political situation or it's more about uh, the certain uh, culture, uh, subculture groups they have coming from a um, certain political background and then they use uh, subculture to express their feeling of this um, like current uh, political systems. Like I'm being uh, like not very clear 
from how you judge these emotions as political. Mm -hmm. So this is more or less a question. Okay, good question. Um, t tell me how you, uh, how you see it. Would you say that, uh, that subcultures always erase or tend to erase from a certain political concern? Would you say that there's more accidental? Um, I think the first one. I don't think it's uh, accidental. Yeah. But also it's a way like, um, mm, it's like which comes first. Is it already like a certain political issues exists? And then it arise the concerns of certain people. And then they use uh, culture as a way to express their feeling. Or it's like this uh, subculture exists first. And then they start to, um, how to say, to answer these um, political issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been, maybe it depends on the certain situations. It certainly depends on the, on the context and on uh, different uh, factors. But I, I will take a risk here and I will say that, uh, that alternative uh, communities are uh, first uh, of all about um, a certain sense of uh, complicity and, uh, and distinction and only secondly about a political, uh, a political agenda. And um, I would sort of uh, risk um, execution by saying that uh, I believe that um, the political is uh, most of all um, a verbal quote, uh, modism, um, yeah, uh, a verbal quote that is uh, that is used among people who are into a certain uh, a certain uh, scene, and that uh, makes it uh, possible for for them to uh, to uh, coincide. I could think of an of an of a very uh, illustrative example coming from uh, Spanish pop uh, pop culture. There is this um, there is this there's there's a singer that goes under the name of uh, Russian uh, Russian Red, and um, and at some point I believe it was what was it like one year ago, she uh, she was interviewed by a uh, music magazine, and, uh, and eventually she uh, she said uh, well she I don't remember what what the question was. But she just said, I, uh, I am a right-wing people. I, I am a right-wing person. Right? And I mean, that was so, it wasn't even intentional. I mean, it was just a passing uh, commentary. But that completely shocked the, the Spanish uh, in this scene. It was like, oh my god. I mean, that, that was, uh, how, how, did that, uh, how did that happen? And it was very funny how the, the entire uh, in the uh, in the scene, sort of uh, became uh, became aware of the political illusion by which everybody was supposed to be uh, a leftist and even a, a revolutionary, even when their uh, songs or their music or their artistic acts didn't seem to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, express it. So. There were like lots of uh, of uh, articles in both uh, general and alternative uh, media that were sort of trying to rebuild the the notion of um, of a leftist uh, of a leftist indie, and it was sort of sort of funny how almost every uh, every singer, every uh, bass player, and every artist felt sort of compelled to uh, you know to respond. To, uh, to, to, uh, to, to Russian red. And th that would sort of, if I am right, that, that would prove my, my idea that, uh, that, the, that the political might, be, might eventually become uh, an, important, uh, an important point. But um, primarily, it is uh, merely a communicative convention. Um, okay. And suppose you're, it's, it's impossible that you all agree with me uh, on this point, so so I want to hear answers, uh, um, responses, and criticism. Go on. Uh, what I just said is wrong because. 
Um, I'm not, not, not here to disagree. I, I, I think that uh, the, uh, many of the things that you talked about today are uh, quite disparate. I mean, whether it's about masculinity or about uh, subjectivity being a production of yeah. the objective and so on. Um, I think that uh, possibly we are missing a cog because I think you're talking about uh, possibly a situation which is more particular to uh, uh, the, the culture in Spain. So even the, w the punk is, it, for someone like me who, who uh, almost was too old to be a punk, um, uh, I think probably the perception of punk in the UK is completely different. Mm -hmm. And I think the periods that you're talking about are politically so different. So, um, um, you know, kind of sort of Franco dies in 75, you know, uh, punk's mm -hmm. heyday is 76, as it were, you know. So it's a kind of, the, the, the historical notions of the places were very different. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, uh, one of the things that what you've been talking about today raises in my mind is whether the actual specific location, the specific context is important or not at all those levels. Because, for instance, I think even the comments that you're making about left wing or right wing, I mean, in the current in the Britain that we live in, those are terms that don't no longer exist. Uh, and post-punk, uh, you know, we had Mrs. Thatcher and we never looked back. I mean, we don't even have a socialist Labour Party, if you see what I mean. So. It's a very odd set of uh, uh, kind of figures that you're saying within the culture of post-punk in the UK. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting one. And, and I think one of the things, again, <coughs> that your, your question raises, and uh, you, you talked about subjectivity. We, we have someone who uh, teaches in the school who's quite obsessed with the idea of subjectivity. And he's coming from a historical point of view. But like yourself, he's coming from a, from a Marxist point of view. And in a very odd way, I think that's quite alien to the culture in Britain at the moment. I think, you know, the, the, the idea of focusing on a problem from a Marxist point of view is very odd. Um, so I, I'm not criticizing. I just, I ju you've left me with a lot of questions mm -hmm. whether, you know, punk in Spain really had anything to do with the punk movement in the UK. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm ambivalent about it because I don't know your culture enough. So one of the things I... I, I comes to my mind is that probably to understand subculture, somehow you have to be part of it to a certain degree. That uh, to analyze it from outside turns it into a sort of system. Uh, whereas to actually sort of live the subculture seems to me quite important in its understanding. Is that, is that something that you, 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 you value or not? Hmm. Being part of that, uh, of that yes. Because I mean, you, you say, for instance, mm. you know, like, like the, the 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 lady who is kind of you know, red flag and something, and then she says, "I'm right wing," and then you say, the, the 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 press writes about it, the kind of popular press also writes about it, mm. and you've experienced them both. I think, do you have to have that? Do you have two the two point of views in order to make a judgment? Well, it's certainly a very um, a very interesting question. I mean. In terms of uh, of the you know historization of uh, of subcultures, uh, sociology uh, books, uh, etc., I would say that it takes somebody who's uh, in and out uh, at the same time. Uh, meaning that uh, if if you're on a uh, on a mm, on an endless uh, pogo uh, day after day. Uh, probably you won't be uh, writing uh, lipstick traces, if you know what I mean. And uh, well, so I would say that some of the most important clues that we have about this uh, phenomenon come by people who were who weren't really insiders. Uh, they they knew what was going on, and they they had uh, friends, uh, girlfriends, and uh, well, they they sort of they, they were around when things were uh, were happening, but they weren't at the center of this uh, of the scene. If if they if they had been, they wouldn't have bothered to write uh, to write the, the books. Because do you believe that that personal uh, implication and personal uh, experience is uh, strictly necessary to talk about, say, punk, grunge, or the riot girls? Um, uh. 
yourself. You can't write about it. All, all, mm. I just think that um, it's interesting to um, possibly, you, you, you refer to a lot of uh, literature which I, I, I'm not au fait with, so I can't comment on that. I, I don't tend to read about uh, a kind of sort of uh, uh, um, uh, commentators on, on these things. So you may be right. But it seems to me that looking at the concept of subculture, one of, one of the things is, you, you said it a few times, is you know, being in it, yeah. being in the in crowd. And therefore, the commentator is always this dodgy person on the outside who's writing about you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was in a culture like that, we had these dodgy people, you know, who were outside what we were doing, and they were writing about us in the press and all the rest of it, but they didn't really form part of the process. And I think it was the same for Archigram, which is, you know, in an architecture group. I think they were doing their thing, and then there were people on the periphery commenting about it. Yeah. So I just wonder, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, both positions are valid, but it seems to me that it's an interesting one. And I think, you know, personally, you know, I think punk died in 1980. So you talk about punk in the 90s, which I think is extraordinary. I mean, there was no punk in the 90s here that I can recall of. I mean, there was a sort of people with the style of punk, but there wasn't a punk movement. That was over. So in a... Huh? Exactly, yeah, so, so that's, that's what I'm saying. That's okay, so 70, 76, 76 was the heyday. So I say, I mean, I almost missed it. Um, and that's the bit I find odd, that then it's other people that use the terminology of what punk is, but the subgroup stopped and became something else and transformed itself into something mm -hmm. else. So that's the bit that I'm saying, actually, I think maybe the point of the subgroup is that it doesn't have a commentator. Uh -huh. No? Uh -huh. that's, uh, that's very interesting. Never, never thought about it this way. Um, okay, let's see about that. First, your commentary about uh, about uh, insiders and uh, and outsiders, which I find very very valuable, reminds me of a classical um, debate um, on uh, of a classical debate certain uh, historians have concerning concerning wars, because um, Eric Hobsbawm once uh, once said. That um, that soldiers could not be uh, that most soldiers could not be relied when explaining what was going on on a on a battle. Not only because they weren't the uh, because they weren't the, the generals who knew who knew the the strategy, but mostly because their uh, their um, recall of the uh, uh, of the battle was heavily informed by uh, by uh, movies. And uh, and uh, and photographs and uh, and even history uh, and even history books, and uh, Hobson obviously was very was very controversial at that uh, at that point because he was sort of uh, of criticizing the uh, the uh, the authority of the witness no less, which some historians believe it's uh, it's uh, it's sacred. Me, I would say that it's that it's okay. To have a soldier, uh, you know, uh, telling how a, how a battle uh, how a battle was, but then uh, the the outsider would also be uh, necessary. That's that's what I believe, and it's just a methodological uh, point. And then maybe probably the, uh, the the problem is that I, I wasn't clear enough when I when I said uh, what I, what I meant by uh, by punk. I, I was actually using uh, using punk in a very general uh, ge general sense that could um, eventually um, that could eventually uh, um, be useful to talk about other um, manifestations of this movement the the hard the American hardcore punk of the uh, of the 80s the uh, the riot girl uh, movement considered and this would be uh, Sarah Marcos's thesis not uh, not uh, not mine as the moment in which uh, girls took over punk, not that there weren't uh, previous examples of, uh, uh, of women uh, leading punk bands, obviously, uh, obviously this, uh, there were, but this was, according to, uh, to Marcos, the, the moment in which there was a, a crucial gender, uh, gender shift that uh, without, uh, that sort of completed the, uh, that sort of completed the, the movement. So Marcos, uh, Marcos thinks that uh, that the riot, the, the riot girl movement wasn't merely an, an, an extension or a late uh, version or a repetition of, uh, of punk. 
She thinks that, that the history of punk wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be uh, complete without uh, girls or a very particular kind of girls uh, taking on, the, uh, taking on the, the stage. And then uh, there are, as far as I, uh, as I know, other, um, well, other, if you may, if you want, late manifestations of, uh, of, the, punk, uh, of the punk spirit and the punk uh, sentimentality that, uh, that take place, well, in, in Spain, in, no, certainly not only in, in Spain, in, uh, as I said, also in uh, Colombia, Peru, uh, etc., with a different, uh, with a different time, uh, time, time period. They, they take place, they took place uh, firstly in, uh, in England, that's for, uh, that's for sure. Um, then, concerning the emphasis on uh, on context, that and I, I agree that's very uh, that that's that's very uh, uh, important. I also um, suggest that such uh, transversal uh, terms as um, well as uh, feeling structure or emotional uh, transfers might be useful to describe you know common uh, aspects of uh, of uh, movements that take place in different uh, countries or even time periods um, well, I, th I think it's interesting I, I think I think you've opened up all sorts of uh, thoughts in my mind I, I, I think something um, that worries me but it's not it's not a criticism is that possibly uh, we are going through a historical stage in which we're looking back at the recent past with mm -hmm. the eyes of today. Um, and somehow, you know, we can look at the sort of, you know, the beginning of the 20th century or the 19th century and so on, still with a very detached historical point of view. And I think the, the global nature of understanding today is being applied back uh, to a period, let's say, over 30 or 40 years, when that global nature didn't exist, I think things were more specific. So whether it was in popular culture mm -hmm. or it was, uh, it, let's say, in something that I, I sort of was more working in, which was, you know, if you compare ETA to the IRA, there's no comparison, whereas now someone would probably put those two things together because they're two movements of kind of political resistance, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a slight uh, kind of danger of, of, of kind of, marrying the history of the last 40 years as if it was all one thing. And maybe I, I am older, I suppose, and I see a trajectory which I, I, I find that the world of, let's say, the 80s or the 70s was a completely different world. And having experienced it, it sort of feels sometimes when it's uh, placed within another context, it's difficult to understand. So it's just a question. It's, it's are, we being, are we taking certain liberties with the last 30 years by claiming them now when it was a very different world. Because, you know, it, 1976, the, the height of, of punk in, the U in London, in the UK, uh, was absolutely fresh post-Franco Spain. I mean, the, the, you couldn't have had a more different context in, at every level, on high culture, low culture, administration, politics, at every level. So obviously that must have had a tremendous effect because the leveling between the two cultures has happened relatively recently, in my mm -hmm. opinion. So it's an interesting point, just simply, you know, how far can one go back, or what does, what does one learn by going back with the benefit of hindsight and the systems that we understand now? Mm -hmm. It's something, you know, it, it, it's, it's part, of, part of your job, really, but sure. uh, it's, it's something that I find quite interesting. Right. But would, would you have issues with the notion that there is such thing as an internationalization of the punk, uh, of the punk? Uh, no, no, I, I, think there, I think there is now, but at the time there wasn't. I, I, I actually b you know, believe very strongly that uh -huh. you know, punk it could only have happened in England, and it was a very English reaction to the outside world, to what was happening in the rest of the world. I think punk is English. I, I can't see it in any other way. I see it as an English movement. I, other things are different, other things are transportable. But I think punk was very specifically English. And what he was trying to do politically was specifically English. And it was related to the system that was here. That's, that's a point of view. All I'm saying is that it, it, it gets, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, encompassed in certain arguments. I think in the architectural world, 
uh, is similarly, things which were happening in the sort of 1974, all of a sudden gets treated as if it had happened in 2009. And somehow the, the world was very different, is what I'm saying, and therefore that kind of historical mm -hmm. context is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. The main thing to remember is it was very, very local. It was parochial. I mean, Punk was in London, and it might have taken two months to go to Sheffield or Manchester. There was no internet. TV didn't reflect it. Radio certainly didn't. It had to go spread virtually via underground channels. very much doubt that a London punk from 1976 would ever know what Franco was. You know, they'd probably just about know where Spain is, but he would never have heard of Franco. Mm. So there was no correlation at all because they, he was sort of so self-centered. I don't remember. So the international attitude or outlook has come, as Charles was saying, by us looking at him for 40 years back. I don't mm. think And can I say something as a person come from Asia? Yeah. I think it's um, very interesting. Um, before in the unit, we used to have the discussion of um, something like punk, mm -hmm. and then all the European students know the history. And uh, but for me, I thought it's just from aesthetic point of view, because mm -hmm. we um, touch all these products like music produced in Asia using punk as a way to sell. And then it raised this really interesting thing of um, subculture with its context and shifting in time. So maybe, yes, it's true, in 1970s, punk was generated uh, locally, and uh, it uh, belonged to certain groups and with a certain culture background, but then uh, it's also very interesting is responding to the larger uh, subjectivity, like economic or uh, political, which is every country would face. And then uh, over time, how these kinds of punk, it's shifting from its uh, political or cultural emphasis into more uh, economical emphasis and be borrowed by the other countries. And then it raises sorry, I think it raises question of um, like uh, what is subculture, and maybe it's also interesting way of understanding it as a more general terms. And like this is what I feel interesting as a, a person outside of its culture and how understanding it from the market and. Uh, economic point of view nowadays. So I wouldn't say, okay, at least for me, I wouldn't say um, punk is uh, dead. And uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, just uh, belong to certain areas or certain period of time. Really? Uh, well, I'm sure that nine out of 10 cultural critics would tell you that it is bad to take a politically concerned, uh, original and uh, authentic uh, subculture that was, um, you know, fresh and uh, authentic and uh, uh, at the beginning, and uh, customize it and make it into something merely aesthetic and uh, and commercial. Well, I'm I'm the one who says that's that's good, that's good and that's right. First of all, because um, I don't I don't believe that. Uh, I mean, I do I do know, and some of you know uh, know this better than uh, than than me that uh, English punk had social reasons to exist. Very strong social, political, and economic, uh, and economic uh, reasons. But then there was a strain of, uh, of, uh, of punk that was mostly, um, that was based upon, um, upon a, well, a parody and a, uh, and a satire of, um, of the, not, not the, not the English left, uh, specifically, but of the uh, of the leftist code in uh, in popular uh, in popular uh, culture. I mean, when uh, when um, Sid Vicious 
uh, using uh, you know nazi uh, nazi uh, signs was uh, was something that pissed off leftist people more than right wing uh, people the way i uh, the way i uh, i see it and the um, the, the part of the punk movement in, in England and out of, uh, of England that was uh, basically a mocking of, uh, of hippie, uh, of hippie uh, culture was, if not 100%, at least 90% uh, uh, aesthetic. And I think it is um, sometimes there are uh, pure and authentic uh, things that, uh, that are uh, terribly, uh, whatever, banalized, trivialized, uh, commodified. commodified. Yeah, that, that happens every now and then. But that's not, I believe, the main um, historical uh, development in the history of uh, subcultures. I do, not, I do not believe in this uh, first as, uh, f first as um, a tragedy than as far as a thing. Somehow, sometimes it starts as a, uh, as a farce. And it becomes something serious. That, that's what happened with uh, with uh, uh, American hardcore punk during the uh, during the during the 80s. I mean, uh, American punk at the beginning was more like the was more like the, the Sex Pistols. Uh, it was about uh, well, it was about uh, being mean, playing real uh, playing real bad, and being uh, noisy. And eventually, it evolved into fugazi. I mean, very serious stuff, uh, politically uh, concerned. Uh, lead singer as leftist uh, saint. That's another possible development.